Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning to those of you who are joining in with us on this morning. Uh, welcome to August the 12th on a Friday morning at 621 in the a.m. Great to see each and every last one of you with us on today. Uh, great to see Reverend Samuel White. Um, Shawana Lord, good to see you on this morning. A Curtis Norford, God bless you on today. <clears throat> Brother Larry P. Wee Woods, good morning to you. Good morning, good morning, Michael Green out on the West Coast. Thank you for joining in with us on this morning. <clears throat> Felicia, uh, Felicia Miller, good to see you on uh, this morning. Patricia Finley, God bless you on today. Uh, Sister Benita Morgan, good morning to you. Uh, Tamika Frazier, good to see you and Zach on this morning. Uh, Kim Cooper, good morning to you and Sister Jean White. Uh, Sister Jessie Scruggs, good morning to you. Uh, Sister Nitra Meeks and women moving forward. We'll meet tomorrow morning at 6.30. Uh, put that up there and remind me, Sister Anitra. Uh, Pilo Daniel, good morning. Good morning to you on today. Uh, Tara Clark, good morning to you. Uh, Bobby Carey out in Oakland, California, 59 degrees, 75, <clears throat> 75 uh, is the high there today in Oakland, California. It is 71 here in El Dorado, and we'll get up into the 90s today. 91, 92 will be the high for today. <clears throat> uh, Sister Patsy Burns, good morning. Good morning to you. Brother Al Stennis, good morning. Uh, Calandra Pierce, good morning to you on this beautiful day. Um, <clears throat> Ernestine Butler, good morning to you, Sister Ernestine, Sister Deborah White Cooper. Uh, good morning to you, Gwen Jones out in the capital city. Jay Crew, good morning, young lady. Sister Betty Elliott, good morning to you. Sheila Gibson, good to have you with us on this morning. Uh, Kalina Graham, God bless you. Simico Turner and Miss Skyler, good morning to you, ladies. Uh, Linda Clemmings, good morning. Good morning to you. Ricky Harper, God bless you on today. Uh, Douglas Chapel, whoever that's representing. Uh, Irene Lacey, good morning to you <clears throat> on this glorious day uh, on today. Great to see you with us on, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, this morning. Those of you who are joining in with us in the Zoom room, good to have you with us on this morning. Our brother Danny Scruggs, God bless you. Our women moving forward will be at the track on tomorrow morning at uh, 6.30. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Our brother Fernard Hicks, good morning. Good morning to you on today. God's blessings upon you. Um, blessings upon your wife and uh, all of the staff that's out at Timberlane and the other nursing home facilities, uh, all the administrators and patients, uh, the residents there, we pray God's covering upon each and every last one of them. Good morning, Brother Jimmy Reed. Uh, God's blessings, traveling grace to you all as you're traveling to your appointment on, on today. Uh, Sister Betty Deutsch, good morning. Good morning to you. Great to see you. Love you and family uh, as well on, uh, on this morning. Again, great seeing each and every last one of you on today. Our MC, Sister McLeeda, has joined in with us uh, today at 12 o'clock. We're going to have a little praise break uh, that will uh, be led by Sister McLeeda. Uh, they will not be on tomorrow morning at 10, but they will be here today. Uh, at 12 o'clock. So join in for the praise break, uh, headed up by our MC, Sister McLeeda Brown. Uh, Sister Janice Carter, good to see you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good to see you on uh, this morning. Thank you for joining in with us. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, at this time, we want to we want to share a little bit with you about uh, those of you who are traveling with us in Purpose Driven. Uh, we are we're focusing on experiencing life together uh, from day 18 of Purpose Driven Life. 
And as we have been sharing with you that part of being in God's family is accepting, number one, who your dad is, uh, then knowing that you have a place to belong to, and then you want to experience, uh, you want to experience family together. So how do you do that? So there are a few things that we've shared with you this week that are essential uh, if you're going to experience life together, this thing that we call fellowship. And, uh, and so first thing is, is to remember that when you're part of family, you're going to have conflict. Uh, conflict occurs uh, no matter how much you love each other. Um, at some point, there's going to be conflict. That's why there's no marriage that has had any longevity, uh, has stayed in existence without conflict. Conflict enables the individuals in relationships to be able to grow. So conflict is important. It is good. It's learning how to have what's called good fights. Okay, the second thing about um, experiencing life together is you have to learn how to be authentic. That means you need to be yourself. Uh, take off the mask. Take off all, all the pretense. Uh, stop trying to impress, all right? Just be yourself because as you are being yourself, people have to learn how to love the real you, uh, not the fake you, not the mask, not the pretense, but they have to learn how to love the real you. Now, uh, in order for you to uh, uh, believe that people can love you, you've really got to learn to love yourself as well. When you love yourself, you don't have to be something that you're not. You can be the true you, the good, the bad, the ugly, okay? But people will learn to love you for who you are. And then the third thing that needs to happen if you're going to uh, experience life together is you must learn uh, about mutuality, understanding that in family, everybody eat out of the same pot. All right. When the meal is cooked, it's prepared for every member in the family. So there is that mutuality. <clears throat> and then we've got to learn that in uh, family, there has to be sympathy, where we learn to sympathize, where we learn how to uh, share each other's pain. Uh, we have to learn how to uh, hurt the same hurt as others and then be there for that purpose of being a bomb in Gilead that will help them uh, be able to go through those hurting, those sorrowful, uh, those grieving, uh, those discouraged moments. Uh, family is about having sympathy. And then finally, uh, on today, if you're going to experience life together, then you've got to learn this thing that is called mercy. Uh, we in the body of Christ, uh, we in the family of God, we've got to learn how to emulate our dad by being gracious unto others. The same kind of grace that you want God to give to you, you've got to learn how to give that same grace unto others. So one of the major components in being in the body of Christ is we've got to learn how to show mercy towards each other. We've got to learn how to be graceful. Graceful means that I learn to forgive you whether you ask for it uh, or you deserve it. I've got to learn how to, to be gracious unto you. <clears throat> Grace means that I give you what you don't deserve, not what you deserve. And so uh, as believers in the body of Christ, we've got to learn how to be gracious <clears throat> towards one another. Uh, listen, the only thing that it calls for you to be gracious unto others when people have hurt you, the, the only thing that it calls for you to be gracious is for you to give up self-pride. All right, your inability to be able to, to uh, lay down your pride makes it extremely, extremely difficult for you to be able to forgive others. And so, um, the inability to forgive says more about you than it does the person who hurt you. So always remember that you've got to learn. You've got to learn how to be gracious unto others. And then let me say this real quick. One of the things that uh, we have a tendency to do is 
because we are because people bring their issues uh, into a small group into the body of Christ, we have a tendency to create names that give a negative representation of the church. Uh, for example, we have a tendency to use the term church hurt. All right now, what does that mean? Uh, what it does is it says that when you're involved in church, you're going to get hurt. Well, let me just tell you, you can create names for almost every aspect of your life. Uh, you have employment hurt. You have the club hurt. All right. In other words, any aspect of your life, if you spend enough time with people, you are going to get hurt. You know, you got marriage hurt. You've got sibling hurt. You've got all kinds of hurts that you can give a name to. It's amazing that it on, is only in the church where we pretend that people will hurt you. The reality is, is when you're dealing with humans, period, and you spend enough time with them, there is, the, there is going to be the opportunity for you to get hurt. What you've got to learn how to do is to, is to be gracious when you've been hurt. Now, here's the thing about being gracious. Being gracious does not mean that you are ignorant. And now, let me explain what I'm saying there. Ignorance means that you don't know. When someone shows you who they are, accept their revelation, all right? Accept them being who they have shown you to be. Now, I can forgive you and not be ignorant when it comes to you. When I know who you are, I function with you based upon <clears throat> who you are, all right? It, forgiveness doesn't mean I forget what you've done, all right? Forgiveness doesn't mean that I give you the permission to hurt me over and over and over again. What, what forgiveness does when I'm being gracious to you, it simply means that I am not uh, piling what you've done on top of what you've done on top of what you've done. What it means is, is that I can love you knowing who you are, and I know that you're someone who may be broken to the point that I don't need to put my trust in you. You see, I can love you and not trust you. I can love you by knowing who you are and what your issues are, and then governing based upon that information. All right, so uh, in the body of Christ, we've got to learn how to be gracious. We've got to learn how to uh, give favor into people's lives. God loves us and God forgives us. And when you reach that point where you say, well, they did such and such to me and I can't forgive them. Here's what I want you always to remember. No matter what someone does to you, it will never reach the level of what has been done to Christ. And he on a cross can cry out and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Then we who are sinful creatures who hurt others, we can cry out when someone hurt us, Father, help me forgive them because they knew not what they do. All right, so, so much for uh, experiencing life together. We're gonna continue to talk about this in week 19 as we continue to travel in purpose-driven life. Okay, now, to our study this morning, uh, open your Bibles, please, to uh, Psalm 78, uh, as we will try to get to the benediction of Psalm 78 uh, on, on today, um, because we, we still have about 20, almost 20 chapters to go. So uh, looking at uh, Psalm 78 uh, on, on this morning, uh, remember that Psalm 78 is, uh, it is a psalm of instruction where the children of Israel is being taught. And they're being taught through this worship song. They're in the temple and it's written by Asa. It is to teach generation upon generation uh, about God and God's goodness and his relationship with Israel. So the worship here is, um, uh, it is, it is instruction through music. And what is he teaching them? Uh, he's teaching them about three things that he wants to happen. He wants them to uh, set their hope in the Lord. Uh, he wants them to not forget the works of the Lord. 
and he wants them to obey God's command. Uh, he wants this to happen so that they will not uh, act like their fathers did in the wilderness uh, and in the past by rebelling against the Lord. And so this is what we've been talking about. We've been talking about uh, their, their disobedience in the wilderness and what God was doing in order to uh, bring them back into proper uh, fellowship with him. Uh, he, uh, he disciplined them and yet they refused to be disciplined. Uh, he brought back to their remembrance how God had delivered them uh, from the hand of the Egyptians. And, uh, and this is where we want to take up our dialogue on today. Uh, so let's start with Psalm 78. Uh, we'll start with verse 52. Uh, Psalm 78 and verse 52. But, but made his own people to go forth like sheep. He's just talked about in the, in the earlier verses uh, how he was destroying the tabernacle of Ham dealing with Egypt. Okay, verse 52, but made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely so that they feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which is his right hand, his, which his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen also before them, and divided them in inheritance by line and made the tribe of Israel to dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and provoked the most high God and kept not his testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly at heart Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the, into the enemy's hand. <clears throat> he gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given to marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awake, awaked as one out of sleep and like a mighty man that shouted uh, for reason of wine. And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah the Mount Zion, which he loved. He, and he built his sanctuary like high places, like the earth, which he had established forever. He chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfold. Uh, from following the ewes, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hand. <clears throat> so uh, what Asaph does here in uh, starting at verse uh, 52, he's talking about how God had just uh, brought judgment upon Egypt and now he is leading the children of Israel uh, safely. The text says that he led them on safely uh, so that they feared or reverenced him but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. So we have the destruction of Pharaoh and his army, verse 54. Uh, and he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to the mountain which his right hand had purchased. In verse 54, he reminds them that God had brought them to, uh, when he says the foot of his sanctuary or the border of his sanctuary, he's making reference to Mount Sinai. It is at Mount Sinai where God gives them uh, the law. This is where uh, Moses goes up and spends 40 days and 40 nights in the top of the mountain. God writes the law. He gives it to them. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 55, he cast out the heathen also before them. 
All right, now, after the children of Israel, uh, after God brings them to Mount Sinai and he gives them uh, the law, and, and the text tells us that he carries them into the land of promise, that which he had purchased. All right, he now begins to talk about uh, Israel and them in the land of Cana, right? Uh, the amazing thing here is that uh, in this one verse, he moves them from the, the wandering in the wilderness uh, into the actual land of Cana. Now, the thing that you should consider as you look at this particular text is uh, earlier in, in uh, Psalm 78, he had talked about, you know, the fact that they had, uh, he had taken them to the Jordan. They refused to go in. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now he remembers again how he brought them out of Egypt, bring them to Mount Sinai, give them the law, and then he carries them into the land of Cana that the text said that he purchased with his right hand. You would think at this point, the story would change and it would talk about how grateful Israel was now that they have entered into the land of Cana. Now, remember when they get into the land of Cana, this is a new generation, right? This is not the same group. This is not the same group who had, um, uh, who had left Egypt. Everyone 20 years of age and older have died out. Only two left, and that is uh, Aaron and Caleb. Well, and Moses, of course, is still left, but he doesn't go into the land of promise. So you got a new generation here that has entered into the land of Cana. God has delivered them. But here's one of the problems. This young generation, they did not see uh, some of them did because they were under 20 years of age. So the older ones that were, let's say, 19 years of age, all right, they're now 59. All right. So they saw what went on. But you had another group that was born in the wilderness that did not see the miracles of God. Now, remember, what is this talking about? It's talking about one generation teaching the other generation so that that generation would seek the Lord, not forget his wondrous works and uh, that they would um, that they would obey him. This is what should be going on in Cana. They're in the land of promise, living in houses they did not build, eating food they did not plant. God has God has covered them from their enemies. They are in a state of high blessings. So um, automatically, what would you say? Well, they're going to obey God. They're going to love God. They're going to appreciate God. Guess what happens? They do just like what we've done. The more God bless us, many times the farther we walk away from him. Sometimes we as human beings, we don't know how to function being blessed. Sometimes we don't know how to be obedient in the midst of blessings. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, in verses uh, 54 through verse 64, it is a testimony of Israel being disobedient unto the Lord. Watch this. Uh, verse 55. He cast out the heathen also before them, the Canaanites, and divided them in inheritance by line, by line and made the tribe of Israel to dwell in their tents. Right. Uh, yet they tempted and provoked the most high God and kept not his testimonies. They're doing the exact opposite of what God has instructed them to do. He has divided, given them the land of Cana. Every tribe have their own dwelling place. They're living. Uh, they have they who were in tents are now moving into homes. Some are still in the tent. And the Bible says, yet they are provoking the most high God. Remember, we talked about that idea of provoking. It's like, okay, do something. Boom, do something. Boom, do something. Saying to God over and over and over again, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to do anything. We're going to just keep sinning. And so they keep provoking the most high God. 
they would not obey his commands. Watch this, verse 57, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. Now watch this. They are responding like their parents did in the 40 years in the wilderness. God had blessed them, delivered from Egypt, and they provoked the Lord to anger. This generation, given the land of Cana, provokes the Lord to anger over and over again. Verse 58 says, for they provoked him to anger with their high places. The high places here is making reference to they are worshiping these idol gods. Now watch this. What was the first command that God gave to Israel when he gave them the 10 commandments on Mount Sinai? Commandment number one, thou shall have no other God beside me. What do they do? They provoke him to anger by building high places. These are altars where they can worship the gods of the Canaanites and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. Wouldn't you think that a God who had done all that he had done for them, that he would have been sufficient? one who's opened the Red Sea, given them manna, given them quails, give them water to drink, have uh, given them houses that they did not build, crops that they did not plant. Having done all of that, why would Israel see the need to worship idol gods? Why would they need another God? Well, let me just tell you, their reason is very similar to the reasons why we do likewise, is because they wanted a God that they can control. They wanted a God who would do what they say do, not a God that they had to do what he told them to do. See, many of us want an errand boy. We want a God that we can tell, you know, give me this, go get me that, supply me with this, serve me with that, make me happy, do what I want you to do but do not want a God who tells them what they can and cannot do. Thou shall not. I don't want a God that says I cannot. I don't want a God that says I have to do this and I have to do that. That's not the God I want. I want a God that I can make, that I can create <clears throat> in, in my likeness, who will bow down to me and I can carry him <laughs> and put him down when I want to. You see, I want a God that I control. And this God of the scriptures, this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is too demanding. He wants to limit me. He wants to determine what I can eat and what, and where I, what I wear. And he wants to determine who I can love. And he wants to determine all of these things about me. And I don't want that kind of a God. I want a God that I'm in control. Watch verse 59. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel. Uh, God, was, God was angry. Uh, he rejected Israel. When he heard the, their hearts crying out unto the other gods and disrespecting him, the Bible said that he, he abhorred Israel. The word abhorred, it means that he rejected them. Watch verse 60, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, all right? When we talk about the, the, the uh, tabernacle of Shiloh, what we're doing now, uh, and kind of keep the Bible itself in mind, remember we've been talking about the book of Exodus and the children of Israel and wandering in the wilderness, uh, God giving the law, well, that's Exodus, Leviticus, uh, them wandering in the wilderness is Numbers, God re-giving them the law, that's Deuteronomy, right? Then you have uh, Israel provoking God to anger. You're in the book of, uh, uh, well, they enter into the land to get the land. That's the book of Joshua. And then they start to provoke God in anger. That's Judges and Ruth. And then they reject God as king. We want a king like the people. And now you are in 1 Samuel. 
right? And so what happens is, is they now uh, select Saul as the king of Israel and Saul, watch this, verse 60, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh. When we talk about Shiloh, we're talking about the rulership of Samuel, um, of um, Saul, right? Saul sets up his, his kingship, his capital is at Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men, right? This is the rulership of Saul. But remember, Saul is in position because the people selected him and God suffered it to be so. Verse 61. Uh, he delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. Uh, here under Saul, the Philistines were allowed to attack Israel. They were taken in captivity by the, uh, their land was taken by the Philistines. It was a back and forth between Israel and the Philistines. This was under Saul. This is God saying, you're provoking me to anger. I bless you. You, you get hard-headed, I chasten you, you repent, then I bless you again, you get hard-headed, I chasten you, you repent, book of Judges, uh, 1 Samuel, All right? So this is going on. Uh, and then verse 61, and he delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. This is still under Saul's rule. The fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given to marriage under the control of the Philistines, the Moabites. Verse 64, their priest fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Uh, again, this is uh, under the rulership of Saul. But in verse, this is how Israel has done, All right? So now where are we? We have gone from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. Watch this. Starting in verse 64, 65, uh, then the Lord awake as one out of sleep. When the text here starts talking about God awaking out of sleep, we know that that is a metaphor because God never sleeps, he never slumbers. Well, what is it making reference to? Under the, uh, under the guidance of King Saul, the Philistines, and I know I'm being real technical here, but what else can I do, okay? Um, the, the Philistines, they were allowed to be the switch that God would use to chasten Israel. But when, when Saul dies, when Saul dies, then God selects a new leader by name of David. And under David's rulership, Israel now puts her enemies uh, to task. Uh, David becomes that king that will ultimately defeat all of Israel's enemies. It is under David where uh, the children of Israel will ultimately become a united kingdom. Then the Lord awake as one out of sleep and like a mighty man that should by reason of wine. And he smote his enemies in their hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph. Now, what is that making reference to? Uh, this is talking about the house of Saul. Saul, a Benjamite, he comes through the line of Joseph. And he chose, uh, moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim. Remember, this is where Saul comes from. Verse 68, but chose the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah is where David comes from. All right, he chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth, which he had established forever. All right, we have the capital being established in Jerusalem under David, the new king, the young man that would be the representative of one who would, um, uh, uh, a man after God's own heart. 
it is this young David that would uh, say to the people that we have got to stop provoking God to anger, that we have got to obey the Lord, that we have got to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. It is this young David that would pull God's sheep together. He would serve as the under shepherd for the Lord and he would love the sheep, but he would love the, the over shepherd more than he loved the sheep. And so God blesses him to establish uh, the capital in Jerusalem, the Mount Zion here. Uh, he loved, he built his sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth, which he had established forever. He's talking about the longevity of David's uh, authority, the longevity of his kingdom. God makes a promise to David. And here's the promise that God made to David, that thou see would always sit up on the throne and to thou kingdom, there will be no end. He, he gives uh, eternalness to David's kingdom, just like he gave eternalness to the earth itself. Now, you know immediately what that does. When we talk about the divanic, when we talk about David's kingdom and, we're, and it's established in 2 Samuel, and then it talks about uh, it being established forever, Watch this, you all. We have gone from 2 Samuel all the way to the Gospels because here's the good news, and that's what the word gospel means. The good news is that David's son sit on the throne. His name is Jesus. Now, he came to establish David's throne, but guess what we did as humanity? We did the same thing as Israel, Israel, we reject it. And when we reject it, watch what he did. He acted in grace. And, and so he suffered himself to be killed. He ascended on high. He sent the Holy Spirit so that he could now tabernacle among men and build the kingdom of heaven on earth through his body, the church. And watch this. Now we have gone from the gospels, through the acts, through the epistles, and then guess what? Someday, David's son is going to sit on the throne on earth in the new Jerusalem, and now we're in Revelation. Here's what they did. They taught the entire Bible in this song. Verse 70, he chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. Watch this, verse 72. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. This is not just talking about David. It is talking about the seed, S-E-E-D, of David in the very person of Jesus. And watch what he says. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart. This is what you're receiving every day. When you are feeding on the word of God in the very person of Jesus as God's sheep, who is part of the body of Christ, Jesus being our good shepherd. Let's close out in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you this morning that you have blessed us to be able to learn the story, uh, this, this, this awesome story of how you have loved humanity from Genesis all the way to Revelation. You have been consistent. And unfortunately, Lord, we've been inconsistent in our unfaithfulness to you. But thank you for favor. Thank you for grace. Lord, thank you for an undying love. Thank you for that, that long suffering that you grant unto us as your children. We love you so much. We really do love you. As Peter said to our, our brother Jesus, Lord, you know our heart. Our actions all, don't always demonstrate it, but thank you for looking beyond our faults and saw our needs. We love you. We praise you. We magnify you. It is in the awesome name of Jesus. We do ask these in all blessings. Amen, amen, and amen. Listen, you all. 
Let me just remind you again that you are God's word manifested in the flesh. You are to be that testimony that tells others, this is what it looks like when you are a child of God who walks by faith and not by sight. Remember, God left you here to be a blessing, never to be a burden. Be a blessing to someone and we will see you Monday morning with Wake Up With Pastor. Until then, you all be blessed. Join us today at 12 o'clock for a little praise break as we continue to glorify and magnify the Lord. You all be blessed. God bless you.